Well, hello everyone. We're so glad to have you join us today. And it's exciting to have our first presentation, uh, what the grid, When the Grid Lets You Down. Um, it's gonna be a wonderful workshop um, taught by uh, Jonathan and Kyleen Jones. They're the authors of The Provident Prepper, A Common Sense Guide to Prepping from Emergencies. It's a great book. <clears throat> Uh, Jonathan is a retired licensed civil engineer and an enthusiast of alternative energy sources. He's also served as a re, uh, city councilman and developed the city emergency preparedness plan. Kyleen has been the editor for the Journal of Civil Defense published by the American Civil Defense Association. They practice before they teach their tried and true techniques and preparedness. They host a website, theprovidentprepper.org. So we want to turn the time over to Kyleen and Jonathan at this time. Hello, everyone. All right. Thanks for joining us today. We know that you have lots of things that you can do with your time. This is something great that we appreciate that you're doing. As was mentioned, our topic today is when the grid lets you down. And some of you have had an experience with that recently, and maybe that's what brought you here. But whatever brought you here, we intend to provide you with some good, no, some great ideas <laughs> to help you get through this. And as we start, the first thing that we'd like to do is ask some poll questions. So Marilyn, could you put that first poll question on the screen for us? I think this is how it works. There we go. So what we'd like to know is what is the longest that you have been without electricity? One to three days, four to 10 days, 11 to 30 days, or more than 30 days. So if you just take just a minute and answer that question for us, we would really appreciate it. And Marilyn, I have no way of seeing the number of people who have answered this. And it could be just because I'm not familiar with this software. But let's give you just another couple seconds. Three, two, one. Can we see the answers, Marilyn? Oh, sorry. Did it die? Oh, there it, no, there it is. Oh, I have to look. I can't barely see this. Oh. So 70% are one to three days. And what is that 18% for four to 10 yes. days? Mm -hmm. oh, you guys have been so lucky not to have a long-term power outage. But I wouldn't count on having that same degree of fortune in our near future. So it's a really good time to prepare for that. Um, so, and on that note, Marilyn, will you put up the second poll question for us, please? I really appreciate yes. the feedback, you guys. It helps us to know what your needs are. So I'm not seeing that second question on my screen yet. There we go. So, Rate your level of preparedness for a short term, which would be up to two weeks, power outage. Are you a novice with no clue what you're doing? And that's why you're here today. How about a rookie? You know enough to be dangerous. And there is quite a few in that category. Or you're seasoned, which means that you're practice, stocked, and well on your way. Or are you an expert and you are just ready for anything? So if you'd take a minute and rate your level of preparedness for a short-term power outage. We've got about 80% of the vote in. All right, let's get those answers. We're still getting votes, so oh, okay. bear with us for just a couple I'll try more and patient. Oh, okay. All right, here we go. Let's see. Oh, did it share? Oh, there we go. 
All right. So only 14% are novices. Great. Oh, we got a lot of rookies. This is perfect. So what is that? 62% are rookies and seasoned are 32%. And we have a couple percent that could actually be teaching this class. Absolutely cool. All right. Thank you so much for that input. So in this presentation, we're going to cover this. Okay. Um, so the first thing we're always going to do when we think about preparedness is to do a risk evaluation. We want to know what we're planning for and preparing for. There's all these pieces of information out there telling us what to do, but we need to look at our specific risks and then we can help to meet those. You want to make sure you're looking at things like special needs, um, maybe uh, more of the elderly or the young that you have responsibility for. How are we going to take care of their needs? How are we going to provide for lighting, heating, water, sanitation, cooking, and backup power? So we'll address some of these in more detail than others. But let's get going here. Yeah, so generally we're just going to review most everything except for the cooking. The cooking will actually be the focus of this presentation. But as you can probably guess, a mild weather outage isn't going to provide near the challenge that a maybe a severe winter time outage is going to provide so a mild weather outage might just be an adventure it might be inconvenient but it might just turn into an adventure yeah. on the other hand a severe weather outage is going to be completely different and you're going to have the potential it's potentially a life or death situation now we're crazy if you know anything about us we do lots of experiments so this photo is actually from a time when we lived in Provo and we turned off our power in January just to see if we could survive. And in the bottom right hand corner, that is a video. Um, if you go to YouTube, you'll find it. It's how to survive a winter power outage. But we go through and we talk about the lessons that we learned and the things that we're doing differently because of this. But if you look at my little Ben there, his hands are just red and cold. It was quite a crazy experience, and quite frankly, we had done a lot of book learning, so we had prepared a lot in advance, and I was surprised that it was actually so challenging for us to get through this. Well, for me, I'm the wimp. The kids actually did really well. They had smiles on their faces most of the time, even though they were... He wouldn't know. He was at work <laughs> in a heated office. Okay. So, um, short-term and long-term power outages, um, they have similar preps, right? The difference is you'll need more fuel, more supplies for a long-term power outage. So one of the first things we'll talk about briefly, uh, power outage lighting, because dark can be dangerous. If you're stumbling around in the dark, you're making the problem worse. So just having a little bit of lighting that can help you see is pretty important. And there's a few different forms of lighting that you need. You need task lighting so that you can see what you're doing. You need area lighting and you need lighting that will provide just general safety so that you are not completely in the dark. Our favorite lighting is um, actually solar lighting um, because it's renewable, um, but think about those batteries and whether or not they're disposable or reach, rechargeable sources. And one of the things that we learned in our experiment was everybody talks about lighting a candle and using using open flame sources and we found them to be very dangerous now we did have little kids running around and i'm quite attracted to the flame i'm a bit of a pyro myself and so for us while we still store candles and we still use candles it was safer for us to use alternative forms of lighting rather than um, using the candles and the other thing that i think is really important to understand is that children are very frightened during a power outage. And this is a really scary thing for them. So think about making sure that each one of your little people or anybody who might be more generally afraid has some type of a very safe comfort lighting. Glow sticks are a huge hit at our house. They're not very expensive to buy in the store. My thing down my top, that was really good. Um, but, um, I think it's really important that you just consider that. So you can go on YouTube and we have a video, Brilliant Ideas to Light Your World in a Power Outage. And, and in it, we'll review all of the different light sources and what you might want to consider to light your world during a power outage. 
Next, we're going to talk a little bit about emergency heating, and this can be vitally important. You can see in the picture here some of the things that you can do to help conserve heat, and some of those you can take care of now. Cold, cold areas where, where cold air is coming in, maybe it's around a door that you don't use much, but it's not sealed real tight. You can see you could tape that up. You can cover windows with a layer of insulating, insulating plastic, which is very inexpensive, and this painter's tape makes it easy to to put on and take off. Um, yeah, don't use duct tape, seriously, it will just rip that paint off and you'll have to repaint your house. Right, but the goal here is to keep the, the heat in and the cold out. So things that you can do to accomplish that will help a great deal. Yeah. And again, another YouTube video that we just created a few weeks ago about this, it's six life paving, six life-saving tips to keep you warm during a winter power outage. Um, and the one big tip that we want you to take away about emergency heating is to create a micro environment. Now, I first got this idea from a friend of mine whose parents lived through the Alaskan earthquake. And while most of their house was intact, their fireplace was damaged to the point where they were unable to have a fire in it. And so they could have no other heat source. And they set up the family tent in the middle of the living room and survived that great Alaskan earthquake just because they had created that microenvironment. So when we did that little experiment where we shut off our power when the children were small, those pup tents were amazing. I So the kids, I dressed them all up really warm and inside the pup tents, they had these zero degree sleeping bags. And um, I actually had to sleep in my own bed. So I went in my own bed and they were in the living room. But in the middle of the night, I woke up and I was terrified that I had killed my children because of this stupid idea that I had to turn off our power. And I went out there and I unzipped those pup tents and the kids were laying on top of their sleeping bags like this. <gasps> and there was this whoosh of hot air that came out because they were so nice and toasty warm in there. And it doesn't have to be a tent. A tent's just really convenient, right? You could use a bunk bed and put blankets over the top of that bunk bed and have the people sleep. Oh, share my webcam. Did my webcam go away? Super sorry about that. Um, okay, so where was I? Um, anyway, you could put it over the top of a bunk bed. You could put blankets over the kitchen table and have them sleep underneath. Anything that creates that micro environment will significantly keep you warmer than if you don't have something like that. So that's your huge takeaway from today. Understand micro environments. And that video, it talks a lot more about that. I'm gonna go ahead. You wanna talk about this one while I get rid of this? Um, so now we're gonna talk a little bit about alternative heat sources. Um, again, we don't have a lot of time to cover this, but some of the things that you could do include this little tea light heater. And, okay, so tea lights, one of the things I really like about them is they're very safe to store. They're not an explosive fuel. They're also very inexpensive. So if you live in an apartment or a small place where either financially or space you're limited, this might be an answer for you. And um, in this video, um, we just we talk about it. it candles as an emergency fuel source for warmth light and cooking um but it's amazing it's not going to heat your whole room it's not but it creates this nice localized heat source so that you can can warm up um why is this not working now there we go um another thing that you can do is use these portable um folding camp stoves to put safe heat in now we're gonna talk a little bit more about safe heat, but safe heat is not the same as regular sterno. Regular sterno fuel could be unsafe to burn inside because of some of the toxins that it produces. Safe heat is designed to be used by caterers to use indoors. So this is a fairly safe form of fuel. So what you do is you have this folding camp stove, you put a small terracotta pot on top, and then you put a little piece of aluminum foil or, or something metal that's not gonna catch on fire, right? Over that hole, then you put a larger one on top of it. And as you can see, 428.9 degrees. This isn't gonna warm your whole room at all, but what it's gonna do is create a nice little localized heat source for you. And the really cool thing about this is that you can also use it to cook. One of our favorites is the 
Mr. Buddy propane heaters. These come in a variety of sizes and they are safe to use indoors. Now, if you're above 7,000 feet, they say that they are not safe to use. But for most of us, um, these are a very safe source of heat that you can use. These use propane and they put out a lot of heat. Yeah, and there, there's uh, several different varieties. I'm not as big of a fan of the large one because you have to have D batteries to operate the fan. And so it's fine if you store lots of D batteries. Um, but yeah, this is a great option. And our favorite is our wood burning stove. Now we realize that many of you are in areas where it is not legal to use these. But if you are in an area where you can have a wood burning stove, this is amazing. This cooks our food, it heats our home. It just is an amazing tool. Right. It's lousy in the summertime for alternative cooking, but there you go. And then emergency water, that's the third thing that's really important. You might not think about this as much in the wintertime as you do in the summer, but staying hydrated is critically important. We recommend that you have two gallons per person per day. There is a video that we just put out yesterday on how to store water for emergencies. If you have questions about that, really take a look. Also on our web store, website there is how to store water for emergency preparedness and it goes down and tells you exactly what containers are okay how you do it how you treat it whether or not you need to treat it so that's a really good place to start this is john's favorite subject ever emergency sanitation it <laughs> is um, in most cases you will still have working plumbing but there will be situations where you may not you need to make sure that you have the ability to take care of your sanitation needs. So make sure you're stocking up on toilet paper. I, I had heard from a few friends that Costco was running out of toilet paper again at the election time. So make sure that you stock those supplies, everything that you need so that you don't have to run out and do anything during a power outage. But um, be prepared in case you don't have running water or a working sewer. We created a video series for newbie preppers that are just beginning, that just simplifies everything. And step three is all about sanitation in a very easy to understand format. So that's a good place to go to learn more. Now, what the bulk of our presentation is about, emergency cooking, how to cook when there's no power. Now, you know, I'm a crazy lady and how we turned off our power in January well, last year for the month of November, we took a grid down cooking challenge, which meant that for the entire month of November, we did not cook with any electricity or any natural gas. Everything. That includes our Thanksgiving dinner. It did, our Thanksgiving dinner. And we had company over, unlike this year, um, but we had company over for Thanksgiving dinner and we still had to do the cook turkey and everything else with that. So we're gonna talk a little bit more about that, but we learned so much. You see that cinnamon roll right there? Now the bottom part was edible, but obviously when you're charring food like that, you wanna be doing that when you have the ability to run out and get some fast food for dinner, or you have enough food supply that that food isn't precious enough that you have to eat what you charred. Um, you want to cook, be able to cook indoors safely. It's Carbon monoxide is not your friend. It can kill your family. And, and we wanna make sure that we're not doing anything that could be dangerous to our family inside the house. So indoor cooking is different than outdoor cooking. And we're gonna talk a little bit about that. But oh, if you want to see our grid down cooking challenge, there's a whole um, series of videos on that. Just go to the Provident Prepper grid down cooking challenge. And um, it was really, Quite informative. But as it says, practice, practice, practice. Yeah. That is the key to all of this is practicing so that you know what you've got and you know how to use it. Okay, um, one of the best fuels for cooking indoors is alcohol. Um, and this, what you're looking at right here is a little alcohol burner. And what you do is you dump the alcohol in the center. It's actually the fumes that burn, but it burns really clean as long as you're using a clean form of alcohol. In the video, um, best alcohol fuel for preppers and campers, in the lower right-hand corner, you can see that we compared cost-wise as well as how well um, they were able to produce to see what worked best. Isopropyl alcohol, while it was by far the cheapest, produced a yellow sooty flame that just not did not work as well. Um, Everclear was the most expensive and it performed really well. 
but um, the safe heat, those cans of heat, man, they store so nicely and they worked really well as well as the denatured alcohol. Um, and this is the safe heat. You can see those cases of safe heat that are right up there. Remember we talked about it. This is different than sterno fuel. This is intended to be used by caterers to safely cook inside. Um, so make sure that you do that. The cheapest place I've ever found to buy them is at Sam's Club. So if you have a Sam's Club card or you have a friend that has one, um, this is a great place to go and stock up on this. You can also buy it on Amazon. But it is safe to store, and that's something that a lot of fuels aren't. But as you can see, it, it just works really nicely. Um, butane stoves. Butane is a great fuel because it's hot, right? Um, alcohol doesn't burn as hot, but butane really works well. Now, these sterno stoves, not all of these camp stoves that um, cook with butane are safe to use indoors. So make sure if you bought one for camping, chances are it's an outdoor stove or one that you have to ventilate to make it safe to use. This one right here, actually I picked it up at Sam's Club, but it is designed to be used by caterers. And so it's designed to be used indoors. If you check out the video um, about cooking with butane, um, it'll explain all of that and kind of how to safely store butane because you, butane cartridges, they're like little bombs. So you've got to store them really carefully. You don't want a lot of little bombs in a place where they could do a lot of damage. Then we talked a little bit about the candles, right? Um, in the upper right hand corner, you'll see that we've got little tea lights and we are cooking with them, but it takes, if the heat is just really low. It takes a long time to do that. Um, in this picture, we should have had the pan closer to the tea lights and it would have worked a little bit better. Yes, it will cook, but you have to be creative and um, it's just not going to do as good of a job. This is a Herc oven made by Titan Ready. And um, we I fell in love with this for part of our um, grid down cooking experience because I could cook with tea lights and I could actually bake very few places was I able to bake unless I took it outside? And I'm lazy. I really like to be able to cook indoors. And propane stoves and ovens also do a really great job. Most of these are not rated for indoor use. So make sure that you know what you're getting, but this can be a good uh, resource for you as well. Yeah, and in our cooking challenge, because it was so cold and windy outside, we did take this Camp Chef, the one that has the oven, and we were using it in the garage. Propane is heavier than air, and that is one of the main problems with it, is that any leakage that you have will just find a low-lying space and, and pool and wait for an explosive risk, right? Or it's an explosive risk. So we don't want to do that. Um, outside, you don't have a problem with that. In the garage, that garage floor is slanted out, so it would take it outside. So and make sure that you have ventilation. Yeah, and we did. Yeah, made sure we had ventilation. John is the safety Nazi. I'm surprised he hasn't given his speech yet. I, I will give a speech later. Okay, <laughs> we might run out of time. Okay, solar ovens. Wow, what a great way to cook if you have the sunshine, right? It depends on the day. There are days during the summertime when I can't cook with my solar oven, but there are also days during the winter when it, like we cooked when it was 10 degrees, but the thing was, was that it was a clear day. And so you had UV. If you can get a sunburn, you can cook using a solar oven. And it is super easy. These two boys made that pumpkin bread, pumpkin chocolate chip bread, all by themselves using the solar oven. And again, there's a video that talks more about it. We even cooked a turkey. Well, we cooked a few turkeys in the solar oven successfully. So. And rocket stoves are one of our favorites. These are obviously an outdoor tool, but rocket stoves provide a lot of heat for minimal um, input. So these are something you might want to look at. So all these rocket stoves, look, they're, each of them are different, right? They use the same concept, but it's a little bit different design. The Minuteman rocket stove is in an ammo, ammo can, right? And um, it all kind of comes apart and sets up, but it's really easy to carry and that's one that we're experimenting with right now so we should do a video on that sometime soon but i have to experiment with it enough that i'm comfortable with it before we do that um on the lower corner there is a um, kelly kettle which quite frankly is one of my very very favorite rocket stoves and one of the reasons why is because you've got this little cooktop 
um, but you've got this water jacket that can fit on top and it can bring water to boil using just small pieces of debris in a very short period of time. So it won't cook for a large family and that's a bummer. Um, we did make hamburgers on it the other day and it took us like 45 minutes before everybody had their hamburger cook cooked. But I mean, everybody was fed, but not at the same time. Um, this Helios rocket stove is from Titan Ready. It's really good because it's really large and you can cook large pots of food. Um, one of the things that I really like about it is that you can just open up the bottom to dump out the ash. These other ones, sometimes it's a little bit of a pain because you build up that ash and you have to scoop it out in order to keep burning. So rocket stove technology is a great way to use debris and very minimal fuel efficiently. Now, okay, this is a little bit embarrassing for me, but when we did our grid down cooking challenge for that month of November last year. I had seen this at one of the expos and I really, really wanted it, but it was way out of our price range and I couldn't justify buying it. So um, it's a Bear River rocket stove and we called Dan and said, hey, we are doing this. Can we just borrow one for the month? And we made our entire Thanksgiving dinner, including our turkey and all kinds of, uh, you know, stuffing and potatoes and stuff that we were putting on top. and it was fantastic. And when the month ended, I told John, I don't care. You can't send it back. I have to have this. So I now have this. And which means that I can help cook for my neighborhood, right? right. But I, right. I really, really like it. With the rocket stoves, it takes a little bit of time to learn how to use them correctly and to get the hang of it. So if you're using one, don't get discouraged at first. Make sure that you, you give it a good try and learn how to use it. Charcoal. Charcoal is a great cooking fuel because it's, it's got a lot of BTUs in a very small package. But the other thing about it is that it is super safe to store. It's not going to explode like some of your other fuels. So you can store it. We like to store it in plastic buckets. Um, and you can use plastic buckets that you can't use for your food, things that have had toxic substances in them. And there are a lot of different cooking devices that you can experiment with and I, you know the cob cooker is a really good example in that when you have a grill it comes with this frying pan attachment right there we're making scallop potatoes we've made eggs and all kinds of different stuff in it and it's it's just a really good thing but dutch oven that's a really good emergency um, way to cook and then again we talked about our wood burning stoves um, super sorry that most of my audience can't do that but i am a huge fan Five minutes. Oh, <gasps> okay. And, um, and then we'll answer questions. Okay. The last one that we want to talk about is retain heat cooking. Okay. Remember the tent thing? If you don't take anything else away from it, I want you to take this away. So there is a video about retained heat cooking. And I'm, I'm looking to see what the actual title is. Thermal cookers, powerful solution for efficient emergency cooking. And what, he, what it does is it uses a quarter of the fuel. It takes four times as long to cook, but you save so much fuel. So that um, pan that you see with the carrots in it, that there's a pan that comes out of that. You put it on you know, your alternative stove. A lot of times I was using the butane stove. I bring it up to a rolling boil, put the lid on it, and then we tuck it away in this cook and carry. Sometimes they call it a shuttle chef, but we just put it away. I put a blanket over it for additional insulation. And then it just cooks. And when we opened it, you can see those carrots are hot, they're soft, delicious. And you know it can be four hours later, or it could be 12 hours later. It doesn't burn the food. Um, it's a really, really good option that I would really encourage you to explore. Um, the other thing that we have done, because those are pricey, and if you get a cheap one, you will regret it because they're just not as effective. But we've taken, like you see here, an ice chest, line the bottom with blankets or with um, towels. Then you wrap the pot that, that you've already brought up to a boil, right? This works best with soups and stews and beans, anything that has a large amount of liquid. But you're going to wrap up that pot and tuck in all kinds of insulation so that you don't have any air pockets. Close that lid and let it cook without using that extra fuel. Um, I would highly highly recommend this. Okay, let's take just a minute and that's really about all we have on some backup power. Uh, some of the options you might have are the natural gas 
generators that are attached to your house. They have an automatic um, switch that when the power goes out, they turn on. The, the only downside of that is that they are relatively expensive and in an extended long-term outage, you may actually lose natural gas as well. So um, they can be awfully good, but they might have some downsides as well. Obviously, there are other just normal generators, uh, gasoline, diesel, propane fuel generators. Some of them use two or three different uh, options. Um, positives, they do provide energy for you. Uh, some of the downsides is that they do uh, require you to store fuel, and that has its own set of dangers. You need to make sure that you store it legally and safely. Um, they have to be used outside. Um, they can't even be used in your garage because they produce a massive amount of carbon monoxide and you cannot put that in any place where that can seep into your home and harm your family. And the other downside of those is they do, um, they are noisy, uh, some more than others. Some are fairly quiet, but they, they are going to be outside and they do create some noise um, either to bother you or to alert somebody that, hey, you've got power. and. Um, there are generators that disappear in any emergency because somebody hears that and they get jealous. So um, one of the options I really like is solar. Um, there are grid type systems. You see them on a lot of roofs. However, a lot of these systems are not able to provide you any energy. If the power goes out, you're just like everybody else because all that is grid tight. Uh, some providers will provide you with one plug or some backup power. So you want to be aware of that if you are thinking about maybe doing some rooftop solar. Um, you can build your own system or have somebody build a system for you, a small system that would uh, accommodate you. Um, they require batteries to provide that storage. But one thing I really like are these portable power stations. And these are normally in the range of 300 to 1500 watts. And if you need to run anything like medical equipment or you have other needs, for power, that may be an option that you can look at. You need to understand what your loads will be, and then you need to match that with a system that will work. Most of these are based on the new lithium battery technologies, and so they do a really good job. Uh, but again, you need to understand what your needs are and, and how that system might uh, need to be configured. Okay, in English, for those of the, us that don't understand all this, uh -huh. the thing that you're looking at in the middle is a humless, it's a backup battery bank. You can plug it into the wall to charge it up. You can exactly. connect it to your solar panels to charge it up. But then once it's charged, what you see here is like there's a cell phone attached to it or a laptop. There's a cooler that's a little refrigerator. It's an electrical refrigerator. And inside of that little battery, it has enough power to not, I mean, it won't do everything, right? You have to understand what his loads and things are, but this little box gives you the, a little bit of power to run like medical equipment and things that might be really important for you. And you do have the ability to recharge that. Okay. That's right. You can be uh, and, and, again. and I'm glad she mentioned that they, they are charged from your household power and then they, you will you buy some solar panels as well to feed into that. It's, and then it's a battery bank that holds that energy and allows you to use it for what you need. I told you, I promised you that you would get a safety lecture. And <laughs> so this is brief. Make sure that you have carbon monoxide and yes. smoke and fire alarms. Those are so critical. Keep them updated and maintained. Make sure that you use open, uh, great caution with open flames. We talked a little bit about that. And if you're storing fuels, make sure that you do it legally and safely. Don't blow up your neighbor. And make don't sure that anything. whatever you're doing is okay with your insurance company so that you don't negate your coverage. Okay. Safety lecture done. Oh, we're so glad. But seriously, okay, it's super then important. Then we've got some time for questions. Okay. One second, right. though. One second, okay. Marilyn. Just one more second. Okay. Sorry. Okay, so your prep steps, right, guys? You're going to figure out your lighting, your heating, your water storage, your sanitation, your want to know how to cook during grid down but you also need to shock, stock up on shelf stable foods that are easy to prepare that don't take much power right that's really important and then um you're going to practice 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 and you're going to have fun when this happens you're going to be ready you're going to be able to chill and everybody's going to be okay okay marilyn you're up all right great thank you so much wow did everybody get all of that <laughs> we're glad <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> And um, that there 
uh, that your website is available for you to for them to access. So yes. will you tell them what the website is, please? So the website is theprovidentprepper.org. And the YouTube site is just the Provident Prepper. And we do lots of on it, you'll find lots of information that is meant for somebody who really doesn't know what they're doing, who isn't a hardcore prepper, but somebody who's just trying to basically take care of their family. Great. Okay, well, one of the questions that we had that came in was, what about pipes freezing inside your home in, in winter and, and there's no power? Um, what do you suggest to prevent that? That is a great question. Um, of course, one of the things that you can do is just keep the, the water running just a little bit. I don't advocate wasting water, but in order to keep those taps from freezing, and especially on those outside walls, you really need to, to make sure that you keep some water running so that those, those lines don't freeze up. Um, other than that, I mean, there are some things that you can do, heat tape and other things, but a lot of those aren't going to work in these kinds of situations. So, um, and as a worst case, you would drain the lines in your home just so that they don't freeze and break. Okay. All right. So how long does uh, safe heat store? Okay. It's an alcohol base. And so pretty much it will store just about forever, as long as it's in a sealed container. Once you've opened that can, then you're going to need to worry about it. You need to store it in an upright position. Um, and I'll use part of a can and then put the lid back on and use it again over and over again. But when you're storing it for long term, um, we have some that's got to be 13, 14 years old that we have used. And it still is just right because it's an alcohol base. As long as it doesn't evaporate, you're good to go. And that's why one of the reasons why safe heat is such a good um, storage fuel. OK, great. Thank you very much. Um, why aren't you speaking for two hours? <laughs> we will have to back <laughs> another time. <laughs> yeah, we're not, we're not, we're not. If you wanted to give you a taste, just, just put this out there so that you get the wheels turning. And you have lots of videos to go watch, right? Each one of those videos will have a post that's associated with it, but you, you've got a lot of homework that you can do to go and do this at your own pace. So, okay, get out All there right. and be prepared. Um, will will the grid tied solar panels work during the day without battery backup? Um, some of them will. Some of them, are, it, like I said, it depends on how your system is set up. And if if you're thinking about getting grid tied solar, you want to talk to your company and see. Uh, for example, we have a neighbor. They're allowed one plug, um, so they they can plug in. Well, they can plug in two things to run off that solar during the day. Some of these systems are set up so that you don't have access to any of that energy. And some of the companies do offer some backup power options. So make sure that you look at that closely in, in that process if you're going to do grid, uh, grid tight solar or rooftop solar. Okay. Um, how do you handle the disposal of human waste during a, <laughs> and food, human and food during a sewer outage? Okay, so you're going to want to go watch the video on emergency sanitation, the long one that we've done, because we actually go into that. But that picture that we showed you on this presentation is what I call a permanent porta potty, where you put the plastic bag, you actually um, drain the water out of the bowl, right? And then you put that in there, and then people do their business, and you can add things like sawdust or even dirt in there, but then you take out that bag. Now, ideally, we don't want to bury. It depends. Are you going to be able to have, um, is somebody going to come and be able to take that from you in a week? Or are we looking at six months? So I would totally be prepared to bury it because that is one of the safest ways to dispose of it. Um, but in that, that video, really, um, I would go and I would watch it because we really talk. And in the, um, the post that we did on YouTube that we wrote, it talks a lot about disposing of human waste because that's really important. Um, it can make us really sick and cause all kinds of other problems that had nothing to do with the initial disaster. And this is a crisis that we often don't think about, doesn't get a lot of attention. But if our sanitation systems do go down, we've got really serious health issues um, 
And so, yeah, this is something, a, a great question. And we always want to worry about who's downstream from us, right? Because we are a community and we need to not just be looking out for ourselves. So, so it, this is a great question and I wish we had more time to answer this, but it's a, it's a pretty in-depth question. Okay, all right. Um, how do you connect, oops, excuse me, for some reason my question just went away. Just a second here. That's okay. How do you connect gas generators to house electrical lines and outlets? Okay, that's a great question that probably takes a lot more time. You would need to, um, obviously you could have that generator just out there and run cords. There are ways that you can incorporate that into your house. You need to make sure that that is done With wisely a and safely. Professional, uh, I would do it. An electrician is the way to, to do that yeah. because there has to be a, an automatic shut off you can't have that grid power come back on while you're feeding power in. And so an electrician is the way to go to, to make sure that that gets wired in appropriately. Yeah, gotta be safe. Above everything else, be safe. It's better to do without power than to blow somebody up. It just is. Okay, so one of the questions that they had were, are, are the handouts going to be available for those who will watch your YouTube recordings? So. Are we talking about the handouts? The handout for this presentation is actually a handout copy of all of the slides. So those are available. Is, was that the question that was asked? Yes. And so I don't know. I don't know if it's it's that or if there's other handout information that could be used by the participants after they watch your video. So you, if if like you go onto the providentprepper.org. Um, and up at that top bar, you can see where it says action plans. For it'll, you click on that, it takes you to another page, and then it's got all the different categories. And you click on like emergency sanitation, and it brings up an action plan that helps you go step by step with what you need to do to be able to prepare your family. It's it's not all inclusive because every situation is so different but it really helps you to be able to think and plan. So there are those on our website. Um, there are other places where you can, like, if you look at the one on calcium hypochlorite, um, there's a post on how to use that, and there is um, a PDF link on there that will bring up a PDF that has actually the directions that you can tape on a bottle. So there are some things within the, the website that are handouts, but you can always just um, print, the, print the post, too, and put it in a book. Right, so you can have that as a reference. Our book that we wrote was intended to be a really good reference. I wrote it for me so that I could have a reference when things go bad. Is that okay? okay. Thank you so much, uh, Jonathan and Kyleen. This has been a wonderful yeah. presentation. I think everybody's really benefited. Again, if you're trying to find what the book was, it was The Provident Prepper, A Common Sense Guide to Prepping for Emergencies. And um, if, you're, if your question wasn't answered, uh, we'll make sure that it's answered after the session uh, through emails. Um, thank you again, and uh, we'll take a break at this point. Thank you all. Thanks. As we're coming in to take a break, we have someone coming in to talk. Teresa, are you coming in? I am in right now, I'm hoping. Um, I'm Teresa Hunsaker with Utah State University Extension, and I am here to talk to you a little bit about Utah State University's resources and what we have available for the consumer in um, emergency preparedness. I don't know whether my, is my um, PowerPoint showing? You just need to click slideshow, I think. Thank you. There, there we're getting there it. Go. I didn't realize I had not done that. So Utah State University has a website that has a number of different topic areas available for you in the form of fact sheets and publications. We have everything from 
floods and flooding to drought and water conservation, wildfires, earthquakes, and landslides, food storage, food preservation, biosecurity, tornadoes, pandemics, and even more. So if you're interested in getting some research-based information um, as additional resources to Be Ready Utah's wonderful website and the American Red Cross's website, Utah State University does have some excellent fact sheets and publications available to you. Another thing that we wanted you to know in this little commercial break is that Utah State University, under normal conditions, not necessarily COVID, but we are doing things virtually as well, do go out and do presentations on food storage and um, food preservation, including canning, which has been very, very popular this year. As you know, if you've done any, we can't find lids or jars, right? We also do presentations on grab and go boxes and getting your finances in order as part of the grab and go boxes, as well as information on um, family stress. So we have a lot of information available to our consumers and feel free to access the website extension.usu.edu forward slash preparedness. Okay, uh, Teresa, thank you very much for that uh, sponsor commercial there. We really appreciate USU Extension Service. They've been a great partner for many years uh, with Be Ready Utah and um, and our outreach efforts, helping to create the uh, uh, Utah Prepare Conference and Expo, in fact, for many years, and uh, which has uh, since morphed into the Be Ready Utah Expo, which as I said at the beginning was canceled this year due to COVID-19 and has now been, for this year anyway, replaced with this Be Ready Utah webinar. Um, 